Our next speaker is A.T. Cole, a retired lawyer, former chair of Arizona Humanities Council, with his wife, Lucinda, has been restoring the Pitchfork Ranch in southwestern New Mexico since 2005 and is the recent author of Restoring the Pitchfork Ranch, How Healing a Southwest Oasis Holds Promise for Our Endangered Land, just published in February uh, this year by the University of Arizona Press. And, um, and here's A.T. for you. We moved to the Pitchfork Ranch in 2004 and in I think it was 2002 when we were looking for a place to live. We, we holed up in Silver City for a couple days and there was a newspaper article and there was a guy in there named Van Clothier. And so I called Van and we talked for an hour and a half maybe. Um, but I'll never forget, he, he said, don't buy into the pastoral propaganda. And so I think he's maintained that position the entire, the entire time. Um, so, so we uh, so we started the restoration in 2005, and Van did the first project, and it was designed by Bill Zedike, and Bill's kept track of our uh, program for the last two decades, and it's really seen remarkable progress. And we, we use all of the different, there's like 12 different um, types of grade control structures, and we use all of them. Um, but the one I want to talk about today is one that can be used only uh, in, in wetlands, and it's something that, that Bill Zedike, um, I've never asked him, but I think he was stumbling around the country looking for turkeys in his work life, and he saw these trees that were laying down and realized that there was some potential there. So we did this in 2011, but before I go to that, I'd like to show you something. If there's somebody in the room, there are people who are feel awkward around snakes. So if you're one of those, you might close your eyes. But Cindy and I had an interesting experience. The night before we came up here, um, she yelled me awake at 1.30 in the morning. And she had reached down to adjust the, the temperature on her, her, her bed warming device. And there was a, a, a Diamondback rattler down there who, who shook his, you know, and he said, this, this is really my area. My book is right there under the snake. <laughs> pretty clever, pretty clever if I do say so myself. So anyway, this is where we live. Um, had it not been for the Yazden Purchase, the Pitchfork Ranch would have been in New Mexico. So we're not in the boot hill, or would have been in Mexico. We're not in the boot hill, but we're, we're pretty close. And that's where we live over there, and that's the Cienega. Authentic Cienegas don't have trees. So th this is an incised channel. This is an unhealthy Cienega. Uh, it's a Cienega that we're restoring. And we, um, when we came to the ranch, we sort of started out with um, habitat restoration and providing a habitat for wildlife. That was our goal. And we really didn't even know what a Cienega was, but uh, n now, um, our, our goals have really expanded. One is to try to promote Cienegas and, and get their, get, create an awareness of them. There used to be, depending on which authority you ask, there were many hundreds, if not thousands, of Cienegas in the Southwest before European arrival. So they're really, they're a special uh, s sort of water. And so that's one of the, that's, that's kind of a new thing for us. And the second thing is this climate crisis is, is kind of a big deal. And um, there are two recent science papers. One of the papers says that 37% of what the Paris climate goals are can be accomplished by natural climate solution. There's a science paper, peer reviewed, that says that. And there's another recent science paper um, that says that wetlands like sea and this is marsh or what have you, capture five times more sediment than forest and 500 times more than oceans. So we're thinking now that this Cienega is really far more important than we, than we thought. Van did, not all the work here, but certainly did the initial work here. And what's interesting about, about this, Van built this grade control structure right here in 2005. And what's really, what's, what's very interesting about this photograph 
is that you know you heard Van talk about induced meandering, and that's that's sort of Bill's byword. That's what he lives by or has lived by for many years. And what's really cool here is look at this: one structure, one one flow, and the and it pushed it, meandered the water leftward, and it carved out that little area and deposited that stuff back there. So you've got this induced meander all, already. So th th if you could look at this, um, well, these four photographs are taken from the same location. This is looking down channel, down to Soldier's Farewell Hill South. And, and here's the same, the same image taken oh, 15 years later. So you can see those like a dozen trees that they planted right there Conway and Willis, they've gone crazy. And the, the indentation is sort of now is vegetated. And here, here's the same, standing in the same location, but instead of looking southward, I'm looking, we're looking northward. And we take these pictures on about the same day every year, so we've got a, a you know, a trajectory of, of progress. So there's, there, obviously there's no vegetation here. And look at it now. This, this vegetation is a result of that. So this is an area up channel. Uh, this is where we have permanent water. This is the historic Cienega. And you can see when the Cienega was healthy, the water was up here. Um, it was from the toe of the side of the toe, one mouth to the, to, the, to, the next, to, the, to the next side. So it was like two or three football fields wide, and, or two football fields wide, and three football fields long, and now it functions. I hear people talking about Saginas are like a creek, and I always really resent that, because they're far different from a creek, but sadly, this water course functions much like a creek, because it's so inside. But it's, it's changing. Um, you can see here, there's a, probably a two-foot incision um, van installed a, Zuni bowl right here that held back that water. So there's the area. So I, I'm just showing you that so you can see the progress um, that, that, that these that has resulted from the installation of these grade control structures. And now what I'd like to do is to talk to you about hinge felling, which is not very common. It's only good in an area that's watered where you have trees that you can you can cut down um, where you can hinge fell. Um, so Bill came to the ranch and Joseph and I and went out with Bill and I was the grunt. I dug out, kind of cleaned out the area below. Bill told us what to do and how to do it and Joseph ran the machine. And you can see what happens. What's, this, is, this is critical. Um, you're not cutting a tree down and you're not just a hinge fell. You're a hinge fell, but you're also notching and you have to notch it progressively. It's like six different notches, a half inch deep, two inches deep you know, two and a half, three. And, and if, you, if you don't notch it, then the tree is gonna barber chair and you're not gonna capture much sediment here. So you can see how Joseph has notched this. And this is what you get at the, at the, at the foot. And then you can see what happens to these trees. Uh, these branches, they, they turn it and they, be, they become trees. And if you can avoid barber chairing, then eventually, over time, and this is the grade control structure. And what's really re what's remarkable about these structures is that um, you know you can spend anywhere from oh, 150 to 200 dollars up to 2,000 dollars on a grade control structure, um, and, and these cost like 50 bucks. And you don't have to come back. You know, you heard this talk about putting a tier two, a top tier one, and a tier three, a top tier two. And we've done that all over the ranch. We've installed over a thousand grade control structures, and most of them are one rock dams, and 800 of them are off channel. And we, and in one in channel, we have done that. We've put a second tier atop the first tier, and a third tier atop the second tier. But with, with hinge filling, there's no tiering. You don't come back, um, because you've got a grade control structures that is re really, literally, um, forever. The intent here was to illustrate how to create this structure by, by doing the notching, and this is what you get. And what I'd like to do here in the last two slides is show you basically what happens both across channel 
cross-channel hinge filling and off-channel hinge filling. And what, what we realize, you know, if you've got a, a ch an inside channel that's like this wide, but on a big flood, you've got a width of a flow like this, you don't want to just hinge fill across channel. You also want to hinge fill off channel as well and do, do both. So th this is the cross channel hinge fill and you can see what's happened over on the left. You can see the little nick right there and then here you are a month or so later um, and here it is even, even after that. And then eventually this is what you get and you can see all the detritus that's captured. So you've got this great control structure cross channel. Off channel is really almost more interesting because it's 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 uh, in many ways more dramatic. You can see these off channel hinge fells here, and here's one of the early off channel. Bill uh, he he did this one, and that that photograph was taken many many years ago. But but he, here we go another off channel hinge fell, and this this kid and I did this uh, last year an off-channel hinge felling, and this is an off-channel hinge felling that was done in 2011. Um, Bill told us how to do this, we did it. The tree is buried, the tree itself is now buried uh, under captured sediment, and now we've got these 25-foot trees that provide us with a grade control structure forever. This is what you get. Um, here you see the hinge fell you see this stump of the tree. And then, Carlos Sartor, are you here somewhere? Raise your hand. When Carlos Sartor worked at the Pitchfork, um, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, she said there was this area up there, and Van, they'd planted these trees, and the trees had grown up. And she, she said, why, why, don't you, why don't you hinge fell that area? Why don't you? And so, after she left, Cindy and I went up, and we did. We hinge felled all those 10 trees, maybe. And those 10 trees have now grown back. It's the same same gen trees that we, we, we hinge fell, they've grown back. And this, this is the structure that we got. So that's, and you can see how much more we had to go. We thought we were gonna restore this sea in, in our lifetime, thank you. Um, and it turns out that somebody else is gonna have to complete it because we obviously haven't made the kind of progress that we thought. But in any event, um, this is another another option to add to your tool kit, kit, and thanks, Bill, very much for that. Thank you. If you can stay for a minute, A.T., maybe sure. we can, um, if anybody has a question. I have to say that when I first went out to the Pitchfork Ranch, I was really amazed by these structures, and I thought maybe Bill should write another book, Let the Tree Do the Work. <laughs> but um, having these live structures, uh, you know, it's the same idea with the beavers and, you know, letting uh, nature kind of take its course. Um, Sinda, did you have something you wanted to say? If you could come up to the microphone. Who is this? <laughs> so you were saying that um, they last forever. But in a real true Cienega, trees drown, oh, right? Yeah, I guess that's, thank you. It's always nice to have a partner that keeps things level. Yeah, I guess they'll last for a long time until we have an authentic Cienega. And then once, once it's 100% restored, then they will, they will expire, apparently. I think she's right. Thank you for that. Good point. Thank you, Andy. Uh, everybody.